In the summer of 2003, I began filming the series Atheism, A Rough History of Disbelief. As part of the process, I talked to a number of writers, scientists, historians, and philosophers. Having secured their cooperation, I was very embarrassed to find that a large proportion of what went on ended up on the cutting room floor, simply because the series would have lasted 24 hours otherwise. Well, as it happens, the BBC agreed with me that the conversations were too interesting to be junked. And with these six supplementary programmes, they've made the extremely unusual decision to go back to the original material and to broadcast at length some of the conversations which I had. Conversations with people such as the English biologist Richard Dawkins, the American philosopher Daniel Dennett, the Cambridge theologian Dennis Turner, the American playwright Arthur Miller, the English philosopher Colin McGinn, and the American Nobel Prize winning physicist Steven Weinberg. When I talked to the English philosopher Colin McGinn at his apartment in New York, we discussed at some length the meaning of the word belief. And much of that discussion is in the Atheism series. But to begin with, I just wanted to get from Colin a sense of what it felt like to be a sceptical English philosopher in a country as seemingly religious as the United States. Sometimes Americans will, will say, so you don't believe in God? And I say, that's right, I don't believe in God. And they say, so do you believe in anything? Oh, yes. Do you believe in anything? And I say, I believe in many things, uh, and I don't make jokes to them about I believe in tables and chairs, and I say to them, you know, I believe in various ethical causes and political ideas and other aesthetic values, intellectual values, and lots of things that I believe in. And they say, they say that's all you believe in. I say, that's, that's all I believe in. Don't you believe in something God-like? You don't, oh, you don't believe in the traditional God. Don't you believe there's something there? And I say, no, there's nothing there. And it's very difficult to get across to people when, who are religious. When, you, that you're, when you're an atheist, you mean you don't believe in anything like that whatsoever. Mm. It's not that you think nature is God or it doesn't have personal qualities or something like that. You don't believe in anything of that type. Any, nothing supernatural, nothing miraculous, nothing superstitious, mm. no ghosts, no telepathy, you know. Nothing of that kind, that's what it's to do with. It's not that I'm picking on God, you know, somehow, or picking on the Christian God and not believing in him. Mm. I'm, it's just nothing of that type. And that's well, what you've got don't to you then get the answer which I get from people who are not necessarily religious? I mean, they don't belong to either or any of the three uh, monotheistic religions. They will say, not just simply, there must be something, mm. to which I would give the same reply as you, mm. but... Uh, where do you get your spirituality? Mm. Oh, yeah, I suppose. Mean, yeah. Otherwise, there's a shortage of some sort, but I've never yeah. been able to get from them whether it's yeah. like some vitamin deficiency. Exactly. What do they exactly do they mean by that? Uh, I mean, spiritual. Do, do can an atheist be spiritual? I guess it's a matter of definition, really. I mean, it can't certainly can't be if it connotes anything supernatural, but. You know, aesthetic and his ethical values can approximate to what people call the spirit. You know, your most deeply held beliefs about human behaviour might be counted as spiritual, I don't know. Your feelings about nature, I suppose, might be. I mean, I wouldn't use the word. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to me to be a good word to use, to, a risky word to use, but it doesn't mean you don't have, a, you know, any deep views about things, you know, think, or deep convictions about things. Well, but that's often where people I feel always that. say the clergyman crouching in the laurel bushes leaps out and says, ah, your deep feelings are, in fact, unacknowledged uh, oh, yeah. acknowledgements of uh, the God you deny. Yeah, well, one of my deep feelings is that it, there is no God and it's a bad idea to believe in God and it's been very harmful. So if that reflects my belief in God, well, <laughs> that's a strange situation. That's one of my deepest convictions, is there is no God. Now, I happen to share Colin's mm. conviction that there is no God. And in my case, I never believed it. So I wondered if there had ever been a time in Colin's earlier life when he did believe in God. Well, with me, it was actually quite precisely delineated. It was, uh, I can't remember the exact dates now, you know, the exact times, but I think I was about 17 or 18 when the idea of believing in God, and it was Christianity that I was exposed to, 
became real to me, and it went on for about a year, I would say, not much more than that. If you'd said to me when I was 10, what, do you believe in God? I probably would have said yes, I don't know. But it didn't mean anything. It was just sort of, you know, everybody does, don't they? I mean, mm. like the cows, you know, everybody mm. believes in them, right? <laughs> so, so it went, and then, but then I actually started studying the Bible because I was studying divinity A-level. So I started studying it, but we had a very charismatic teacher, an admirable man, Mr. Marsh, who I wrote about in my autobiography, who was very enthusiastic and he was teaching us the Bible and I was having to learn the Bible studying it closely, you know, it's like Old Testament, New Testament. So I know much more about the New Testament than most Christians right now. And I, even now, 25 years later, I know more about it than most religious people. So I actually know it pretty well. It's what got me interested in philosophy. So at the same time I was getting interested in philosophy, it was through thinking about religion, studying the Bible. And I think there were two factors, a confluence of two factors here. One was the interest in metaphysical questions basic questions about the universe. You know, how, you know, what's it all about? What does it all mean? That kind of question. And on the other hand, there was an ethical component to it. Because you find in the New Testament, obviously, mm. a very strong emphasis on ethical aspects of life. I was an idealistic teenager, you know, and it was in the 60s, so that had a profound impact on me, that I, the ethical side. And I was not brought up in a house where ethical ideas were particularly discussed or, you know, and it still has a profound impact on me, the ethical side of it. So those two things, I think, made me think there was more to life than the mundane realities that I'd been used to, living up there in Blackpool, you know, mm -hmm. with the amusement arcades and the pubs and fish and chip shops, you know, and the freezing cold. And There was this idea of philosophical thought, metaphysical ideas, and then these high ethical ideals. A good combination, right? A good combination. So. I got interested in it, and so for a period uh, I was influenced by that. And I went to university studying psychology. And since I stopped studying the Bible, I wasn't seeing Mr. Marsh anymore for our divinity lessons. I kept it up a bit, but it, and I was, and then occasionally would talk to people about religion, and it just sort of disappeared. And I remember going out, I remember sort of trying hard to keep up with it, going to some sort of religious meeting, and I just was sitting and listening to it. I thought, this is a load of rubbish. I just don't think this is true anymore. And then I, I was reading Bertrand Russell, Why I'm Not a Christian, and in a few matters, I don't remember the details, but in a pretty short time I just decided it was all wrong. But and I also you... decided you could keep the ethical side and the philosophical side and jettison the rest. So Russell represented to me an alternative to religious idealism. It was a more, you know, it was a secular idealism. So I realised you could have some of the aspects of religion which appealed to me you could have without religion. And the bits that didn't appeal to me, like, you know, the virgin birth, miracles, strange ideas about how the universe came around, the sort of bits that's very hard to believe, um, you could just cut those bits off and you could keep the good bits. So you get rid of the, the, the theological baggage of religion and then you keep the sides of it that you like. And that's what I have ever done ever since, <laughs> basically the same thing. Um, Was there any crisis in, as it were, uh, unhitching the metaphysical and divine from the ethical to which you continue not, to not subscribe? Not in my case, which is, uh, it, I think it differs from other people's case. In Russell's own description of his fall from theism, he describes it as a deeply painful, traumatic, mm. irrecoverable episode. He spent his whole life somehow dealing with it. Not with me, it, it was relatively easy. It just happened quite naturally. As, as I say in my autobiography, it was... It's like shedding the skin when, the, you know, the skin comes off and you have a new skin and it, it seems fine. Was there a sense of relief as you shed the skin? No, I wouldn't say there was relief. Disapp I think there was disappointment. Ah. Uh, I would have liked, I mean, I would like religion to be true. I'd like it to be true. Because I'd like to be, I'd like there to be immortality. I'd like there to be rewards for those who've been virtuous and punishments for those who've not been virtuous, especially the punishments would be good. You know, there's not, there's no justice in this world. <laughs> Uh, and it would be good if there was some cosmic force that distributed justice in the proper way that it should be. And it still is, to me, a constant source of irritation and pain that wicked people prosper and virtuous people don't. So there's a, there was a bit of disappointment about those aspects of it. Um, but there was some exhilaration too. I mean, Russell has a description which I think is kind of appropriate of a feeling of a godless universe. It's a kind of exhilarating universe. It's something hygienic about it, there's something bracing about it. Whereas the idea that there's this sort of suffocating presence 
gazing at your every movement and thought, you know, and gauging everything you do. And uh, it's a bit, it's a bit oppressive to think that way. Well, okay. Now here you are, the, the philosopher that you thought you might become. Yeah. You have now um, very fully become. Now, in your role as a philosopher, I'd love you to develop the arguments which were previously simply intuitional skin shedding. Yeah. Um, now be more systematic and yes. surgical about yes. it and say yes. why, in fact, yes. the notion of a god well, is incredible. The one set of arguments is the sort of no evidence arguments. Uh, Russell puts it by saying, there's no more reason to believe in the Christian god than the Greek gods. No more reason to believe. In other words, there's no positive evidence for it. Um, I mean, there's no theory that you need to postulate God in to explain some natural phenomenon which can't be explained by some other theory. People say sometimes, will say, well, miracles were performed. There's never any good evidence that miracles were performed. The judgment that they were is usually based on a prior opinion that God exists rather than being an independent source for believing that God exists. So, so there's no evidence in terms of what anybody's ever observed. There's no fact about the world that can't be explained without postulating God. So there's no reason to believe in God, any more than there's any reason to believe in Zeus or any of the Greek gods. So that's on the side of whether there's any reason to believe it. There's the question now, are there reasons to disbelieve it? Are there any positive arguments against it? Mm. Um, there are also some arguments for, like the ontological argument. Anybody want to talk about the ontological argument? Well, well tell us what that argument the is. The ontological argument. This is a very nice argument. Anselm of Canterbury thought of it. I think it must be in the 15th century. Um, he argued that the definition of God entails that God exists. Now, this would be a fantastic result, right, if that... Just the mere definition tells that God exists. So, what's the definition of God? The most perfect conceivable being, or let's say the most powerful conceivable being is an equally good way of putting it. And then Anselm argues as follows. Well, suppose this most powerful or most perfect being did not exist, right? Then he would lack the attribute of existence. But the attribute of existence is one of the perfections, or one of the things which makes a being powerful. But since he is, by definition, the most perfect being, he must have the attribute of existence. Therefore, God exists. Right. So let's go over the argument again. Yes. <laughs> Get the definition of God. How is God to be defined? Let, let's compare this with the unicorn. Well, how is a unicorn to be defined? A unicorn is a horse with a horn growing out of the middle of its head. There's nothing in that definition to imply that unicorns exist and unicorns don't exist. But let's define God, right? An all-powerful, all-good, all-knowing being, right? These are some of his characteristics. And everybody will agree that's the definition of God. So, now, one of the definitions is he's the most perfect being. One of his attributes is utmost perfection, unimprovable perfection. OK, that's, one of, that's the definition of God. Now, Anselm argues, but if God didn't exist, wouldn't he be less perfect than a being just like him in all those attributes except that that being existed? Because to exist is to be more perfect than not to exist. It's better to exist than not to exist. God is as good as you can be, as superior as you can be, so he must exist. So we know by definition that God exists. It's a brilliant argument, right? But it's wholly unconvincing to everybody who hears it. They think there's something going wrong with that, you know. That's a very strange argument. All right, tell us what's wrong, what's well, wrong with it. Well, the difficulty is nobody's ever managed to pinpoint exactly what's wrong with it. I'll tell you what I think is wrong with it, mm. though the issue is, is not by no means clear. I think what's very funny in the art, the bit that goes, science strikes you as sophistical, is the bit that says, God's the most perfect, existence is one of the perfections. It sounds superficially plausible, but what does it really mean, mm. right? It's one of the perfections. I like to compare this to somebody who said, let's take the most tasty meal that conceivable. Mm. The, most con the most tasty meal conceivable. Does that, does that mean anything to say that? This is the most tasty meal I've ever had. But it's not well defined, the most tasty meal conceivable, or, you know, the best football game conceivable. Not the way I've ever seen. What does it mean? I mean, it doesn't, it's, not a, it's not a very clearly meaningful idea. So if we, say, if we say we're defining God as the most perfect being, and we don't really lay down very clearly what we mean by perfect, then what does it really mean, the most perfect being? You know, he has... He only doesn't have the most perfect colours, because he's not coloured at all. You know, what, what is it? it's not clear what it means. So we can't always think that phrases like the most perfect conceivable F are always meaningful. Sometimes they are meaningful. The most perfect conceivable triangle 
It means one whose angles are precisely 180 degrees. But the most perfect conceivable moral being, what does that mean? It's not, it's not clear that it's so, so well defined. So that's what I think is wrong with it. But it's like with many a philosophical argument. Just because you can't refute it, it doesn't mean you should take it that, all that seriously, especially if you know, form your common sense beliefs on the basis of it. All right, so much for the ontological. Yes, right, that's the ontological argument. <laughs> now, uh, um, how about the other ones? Well, I, th here's one I like. Um, people think, I think this psychologically this is quite important to people. That's why this argument is probably more important psychologically. People think, without God, life is meaningless. Where is meaning? Right? It's, just, it's just an empty charade of, you know, pointless and purposeless, valueless, going from one thing to the next. Well... The first reply to make to that is, you don't necessarily need to seek the meaning of life outside of life. Here's the, here's the, the premise, the assumption of that, of that argument. Without there being a, a, a being outside of human life, human life would have no meaning. So the meaning of human life must be conferred by another being. Here's my question. What gives the meaning to that being's life? Right? How does his life, God's life, derive meaning? Well, here's a dilemma, right? Either God's life has meaning intrinsically just by his existence or not, right? Well, if it does, then it's possible to have a, have a meaningful life intrinsically. So why can't our lives have intrinsic meaning? They don't need to have their meaning conferred by another being. But the religious might want to argue, without even reverting to the ontological uh, proof for the existence of God, that the fact, the observable fact, that we do have values yeah. and meanings mm -hmm is in fact evidence of the fact that something has yes. given the meanings in the same way that the argument from design says something yeah. has given the thing design. Yeah. Well, there's two, I think there are two points there. One, one point is that the existence of values itself is an argument for the existence of God, like an evidence argument. Mm. Another point, though, altogether, is the idea that morality can only have a foundation if it's based on God's commands or God's desires, God's wishes. Right, now you, you started with the, fir the, the, uh, the first one, of course, the, the thing to say about that is there's just no reason to think that the existence of values in human society depends on the existence of God. I mean, mm. why should it? Um, there's just no clear, clear logical argument from one thing. Any more than the existence of ears, you know, is a reason. I mean, there, there are various aspects of human life there's art, there's, there's value, there's family, there's all sorts of things that we take to be valuable. Uh, why does any of these require that we postulate God to explain their existence? A more worrying question for many people is, they don't see that morality can have any foundation, can have any absoluteness, unless there's a God to certify it, le legitimate it. That's a, you, know, that's a, you can see that at that point. It's a point that was discussed by Plato long ago in the Euthyphro, uh, Euthyphro argument. And he makes, well, I think Socrates makes a completely compelling case, a refutation of that argument. And it simply goes as follows. The argument, you see, goes like this. Suppose you take as a moral principle, it's wrong to steal. Why is, people say, now, why is that wrong? Why is it wrong to steal? Answer, because God says it's wrong to steal. God commanded that it, you should not steal. OK. The, the point that Socrates makes in that, in that dialogue is to say, well, how can God give this moral rule a foundation? Either the moral rule is itself intrinsically a sound moral rule, or it can't be given soundness and legitimacy from an external command. Suppose, for example, we had the, the rule, it's right to murder. And somebody said, that's not right. Murder is wrong. And somebody said in reply, but God says it's right to murder. That doesn't convince you that it's right to murder. If God says that something is right which isn't right, God's wrong. Right? He can't make something right just by saying it's right. God can only... What God has to do is reflect what's right in his commandments. So that's what he really does. It is wrong to steal, it, to write, wrong to steal and wrong to murder. So God says it's, that it's wrong. And he's right to say that. Why? Because it is wrong in the two cases. He doesn't make it wrong by saying it. He can't do that. If, he, if that was so, we'd have no reason to respect God's morality. In that case, God, as it were, so. appropriates our yeah. in, you know, spontaneous yeah. and indigenous values. Yeah which then get, as it were, reflected back upon this hypothetical entity, right. which then seems exactly. to validate our yeah, beliefs. Exactly. So we don't need God to validate our moral beliefs. He couldn't validate them. He, can, he, he only... His, well, his validations only work in, in as much as they correspond to what is morally right and is morally wrong. He, he can't make something be morally right when it's not. It's not the, another way to put it is, it can't be a matter of God's free decision or whim what's right and wrong. 
people can see that morality is what it is. They know what they ought to do. But human beings are weak. We're weak. We have weakness of the will. We don't always do what we know very well we ought to do. And that is, in most people, produces the phenomenon of guilt. Guilt is a powerful negative force in people's minds. People hate guilt. Right? Guilt is a bad feeling. So you need something to prevent guilt. To prevent guilt, you need something to make you do what you know is right. But since human beings are weak, they don't always do what they know is right. But God gives you an extra motive to do what's right, beyond morality itself. As he's, morality gives you a motive, but it's a motive which is rather fragile, rather you know, momentary, intermittent, and easily broken. But if you've got the idea of God there, it can sort of give it some more oomph, gives it more power. And then you can do what you know is right more easily, more regularly, and that's, you know, perfectly sensible. That's why, you know, it's reason it's not unreasonable anyway for an atheist to think that maybe we need God or people need God because without God they can't do what they know is right. You know, and I don't believe that myself. I think people are not as morally depraved as the religious tradition says. I think most people will do what's right in normal conditions. They won't always, of course, but normally they will. They don't need God. And I think people who sometimes have lived with God as their moral support, their moral whatever it is that they're getting from it, when they cease to believe in God, they feel that it was not as difficult to be moral afterwards as they suspected it might be. And in fact, it was better because there's a corrupting part to that conception of God, which is the idea that you're doing something good because God will reward you and think well of you. And that's a corrupting idea. It's much better to do what's good because it's good, and only because it's good. That, and that's the, your only reason for doing it. But the idea you're going to get the warm, fuzzy feeling, oh, God's really pleased with me today, you know, I did, did this, that's not what morality ought to be about. Having discussed the various arguments that have been offered in favour of the existence of God, I asked Colin to summarise some of the best reasons for not believing. Well, what the classic argument against is the problem of evil. This is, I mean, even religious people find this one very uncomfortable. So the, the argument is simply God is meant to be a being who is all-knowing, all-powerful and all-good. So how come there is uh, suffering and pain in the world? Right? Uh, how does, why does God allow it? God, obviously, if he's all-good, thinks it's bad that this should occur, would rather it didn't occur, right? like any decent person would rather it didn't occur, and yet he lets it occur. Now, that would be OK if he didn't have the power to change it, but he's meant to be all-powerful, and we're told by religious people he intervenes all the time in various ways. So why doesn't he intervene to prevent the death of a child, you know, or the torture of a, of a prisoner? He doesn't do it. So you don't want to conclude from that, well, God is actually quite bad, quite a bad person. That's a conceivable conclusion you might draw. But you, what you conclude from it is the combination of these two characteristics is inconsistent. He's all good and he's all powerful. You need all knowing too, of course, because he has to know it's going on. But it's essentially the conflict between being all good and all powerful and the existence of evil. And the standard reply to that, the apologists of religion will give the, give the reply, God created human beings with free will. Now, there's the question, why did he do that, knowing the results were going to be horrific? Right? That was a pretty wicked thing to do, to start with. But let's put that one aside. But the problem with that argument is not all of the suffering in the world comes from the exercise of human will. Much of it comes from human, not human, natural catastrophes or... Uh, disease, um, accidents, you know, all sorts of things can, uh, can cause tremendous suffering in humans. They, you know, somebody's born with a genetic disease. No human being had any role whatsoever in creating that. That comes from nature, God's creation, of course, we're told. So God created a world in which it was inevitable there'd be tremendous suffering on the part of completely innocent human beings. But in they... Uh, there might be religious arguments to the effect that he created this sort of obstacle course. Yeah. Um, for his created creatures yes. endowed with free will yes. in order to bring out the best yes. in them. And I always find this, this one, to me, it, it brings out to me the, the sort of hard-hearted, Im immoral side of this way of thinking about things. Because just think about what's being said when somebody says that. You've got the innocent child with some terrible disease and God's up there saying to himself, I really need to test some people here. They need to put the obstacle course needs to be put there. Let me pick on this little two-year-old girl, put her through this terrible ordeal, and I'll test the other people. 
I mean, would, if any human being said to you that's what they'd done, suppose I decided, in my wisdom, I need to test some people here. They, I need to improve their moral characters. So I'm going to do this terrible thing to their child, you know. You'd think I was the wickedest person in the world to do that. Well, why isn't God? If that's what God does, I, I have no respect for him. I think that's a wicked thing to do. God shouldn't do that. If God cares about human beings, he should not allow that to happen. Having discussed the arguments both for and against religion, we turn to speculation as to the reason why so many people still had a need to believe. I don't think anybody has any very good ideas about why this is, especially why they believe in it to the extent that they do. What I would speculate about it is, I think it's less to do with the idea of, of death and survival of death and rewards in heaven and punishment in hell. I think it's a sort of cosmic loneliness, I think that's what's behind it. It's hard for people to accept that we are alone and that nobody cares outside of us. I think there's a, and I think there's a kind of constitutive reason for that, which is human consciousness is essentially sealed off from other consciousnesses. I'm sealed, my is sealed off from you. We only know each other indirectly mm. through the symptoms of the body. Mm. And yet we yearn to be in contact with other people. Love is a lot mm. to do with that. So we have this feeling that we are, as conscious embodied beings, somehow or other lonely in our essence, cut off in our essence. And that's a feeling which we struggle against. And you can see it in literature and so on, dealing with this theme. Frankenstein actually deals with it a lot. So we feel this sort of metaphysical existential aloneness in the universe. And God is a wonderful antidote to that, because we, in the case of God, God, we feel, directly comes into our minds. And we're directly in contact with God. See, God doesn't know us through our bodies. God knows us intimately in our minds. And that satisfies a deep craving, I think, in the human soul, right, for communion with something outside the self. I'd just like to finish with one thing. Here you are, like myself, reluctant to use the word atheist to describe what we are. Mm. It's an accusation rather than, a, yeah. as it were, a conviction. Um, in a country which, in fact, has become more intensely religious, do you find it difficult to uh, uphold such ideas in the America of the 21st century? Let me say something about the, f the first point, the, the label, the label one has. Yeah, to be called an atheist, it's, it's, a, ne it's a negative view, mm. and it suggests that, that one is a sort of professional atheist. You, know, you spend your life arguing against God, which way, way Russell did. Mm. And I think that's a sort of an undignified and rather pointless <laughs> procedure. Once you decide there isn't a God, you know, there's not much point in inveighing against it, mm. unless you think huge harm is being done by the belief in God. But you, don't, you know, nobody spends their time trying to prove to others that the Greek gods don't exist. You know, you just decide that they don't, and that's the end of the story for you. So I, would, I like to distinguish atheism from anti-theism. Anti-theism is opposition to mm. theism. I am an anti-theist because I believe that, that religion is harmful in, to, in human life. So I am an anti-theist. I'm not just an atheist who, who suddenly my only values are that I don't agree with it. I'm actively opposed to it. But then I distinguish that from what I call post-theism or post-atheism, which is the healthy state of mind where you've put all that behind you. Now, we can't do that yet because there's lots of religion in the world and lots of bad results of it. But to me, the ideal society would be one in which the question of religion didn't really arise for people, or if it did, it wasn't a heavy question for them. They would say to, them, to each other, you know, those humans used to believe back there in 2003, some of them believed there was this God and he did this, others didn't, and they were, did TV programmes about why they didn't. What a funny debate that was, you know. Um, so it would be a post-theist society where it, just, it wasn't an issue.